When I was nine, my granddad Fred Ryder died from bowel cancer, which was horrible, as you could almost see it eat away at him. That prompted another move, back up to Farnworth. My dad had a compassionate and overwhelming urge to move nearer to his mem, because she was now on her own, so he packed in his job on the newspapers and we took over a chippy on Harper Green Road. It was a real old school chippy, which looked pretty similar to the one the Khan family run in the film East is East, which I thought was a pretty realistic depiction of what it was like growing up in Salford in the 70s. Certainly more realistic than most I've seen on screen, although the reality was a bit rougher. There wasn't much racism, though. I was about 10 before I even realized that people at school were different races. It just wasn't an issue. We used to have chips for tea almost every night while we were living here, which I didn't complain about, and I can still remember the smell of the freshly baked pies being delivered at 6 o'clock in the morning. It was actually a good chippy, and my mam and dad were a bit more forward-thinking than most, because they served curry sauce, which not many places did back then, not round our way. I didn't have to help out in the chippy, but I would sometimes rob them a bag of potatoes from round the back of the greengrocers or somewhere. They didn't ask me to do it, I just did. They had the chippy for a year, which coincided with the power cuts of the early 70s, so often there would be a couple of times a week when they couldn't open because there was no electricity. They found it hard work, and towards the end my dad got a job at the post office, and did both jobs. Eventually they decided to sack off the chippy, my dad went full time at the post office and we went back to Nana's for a few months, before moving to Avon Close on Madeline's Wood Estate in Little Holton, where we stayed for a few years. Behind our house on Madeline's Wood there was a sewage works, which was so close you could often smell it while you were eating your dinner. You could even taste it sometimes. It must have been in the air. You'd be trying to eat your Sunday roast and it would taste like it had grit in it. The only things that grew on the sewage works were tomato plants, because the human body can't digest tomato seeds, and that put me off tomatoes for years. We would mess around up there when we were bored, just doing stupid things like throwing bricks and other stuff into the sewage works. Then later, when we got an air rifle, we would shoot the rats that were scuttling about. There was also a train track behind our house and we would throw stones at the trains and put shopping trolleys, tree trunks and all sorts, even shit from the sewage works, on the lines. I honestly don't know how we never injured anyone or even killed anyone, considering all the daft stuff we did as kids. But we just didn't think. Then they would send out special trains with railway police on them, trying to get all us little urchins who were hanging round the train tracks and the sewage works, but we had loads of places to hide around there. I also used to love what we called sneaking, tiptoeing into shops and sneaking behind the counters, robbing stuff, without getting caught. It was only small stuff at first. And when I started I did it as much for the buzz of not getting caught as anything else. Although my mam and dad were both still working, they weren't on great wages and were still stretching themselves to pay the mortgage. When I was 14, we moved to Kent Close, facing the sewage works and me and our Paul got our own bedrooms and my dad sought the bunk beds that he'd made out of wire fencing in two to make single beds, but they still creaked. I could never have a wank as a kid, because the bed made such a fucking noise. Our Paul whinged and whinged about his, and eventually broke it on purpose, so my mam and dad bought him a new single bed, but they couldn't afford to get me one as well. I was now 14 and I was still in this creaky bed that I'd been in since I was 7, and it was impossible. So when Granny Ryder got a new settee, I was given her old battered one to use as a bed. It was really knackered and had bloody springs sticking out of it. That's all I had in my bedroom when I was 14. Granny Ryder's tired old settee for a bed, and a chest of drawers. Our Paul had cabinets with a fitted Benetone stereo system, a record player, a tuner, 
an amp and everything, which my mam and dad had bought him. Even though I was the eldest, he got everything, partly because he was the baby, and probably partly because I was a bit of a tear away. It didn't really bother me at the time, because I knew they couldn't always afford to buy for two, and I just thought, he s my younger brother, fine, let him have it. You don't necessarily think anything like that is unusual when you're a kid, whatever situation you're in seems normal. The way I saw it, there was only enough for one, so the kid brother gets it and the older brother is left to fend for himself a bit. That was probably one of the reasons I started robbing. I would just go out and get my own gear. The other thing that I felt counted against me in other people's eyes was that I wasn't very good with my hands. I've never been the sort of person who's good with mechanical things. Even now, I'm useless at working out what's wrong with the car engine. I struggle to change a light bulb. But I always had that entrepreneurial spirit and I could always find or make money, even then. To some extent, I was seen as the stupid one. Our Paul was the bright one who was going to go to college. I was never going to amount to Dick. Just leave Sean, he's never going to do Ode. But it wasn't something that ate away at me, and it's really important to me that people understand that. I didn't hold anything against our Paul. We were really close when we were young, and throughout most of our time in the Happy Mondays. I don't have a chip on my shoulder. Through rehab and cold turkey I've had to do so much self-analyzing and reflecting that I'm pretty sure of who I am and how I got here. If anything is eating away at you inside, it's going to come out eventually, but I really don't have this massive hang-up that I wasn't appreciated or anything like that. I just thought, fine, I'll sort myself out. That was the real lasting effect it had on me. It made me independent. This might seem like a slightly odd comparison, but a few years later I watched this film called Quest for Fire. It's about a group of Neanderthals who have one fire that they have to keep going at all times, because they don't know how to start another fire from scratch. They end up on this marsh after a battle with another tribe, and their fire dies, so they send three of the tribe off on a quest to find another. These Neanderthal geezers go off a roaming the land, having all these adventures, and find fire and bring it back to the marsh. The other motherfuckers are still there grunting, fire, grunt grunt fire, and they haven't built a house or shelter or anything. Weirdly, this reminds me a bit of my situation growing up. I sometimes felt like I was the geezer who was sent off to get fire while the rest of them were waiting back on the marsh. By the early 70s I was beginning to get more into music. There was always music on in our house and when I was round at my Auntie Mary's I was exposed to all different music and influences because there were nine kids who were all into slightly different scenes. Our Pete was the oldest and he had a huge collection of thousands of albums that were leaning against every wall in the front room, about a yard deep. He was into stuff like the Flying Burrito Brothers, The Birds, Captain Beefheart and Link Ray. Our Joe was an early skinhead, and into soul stuff like James Brown, Billy Preston and a bit of ska. Our Mag was into soul and the Thames. She was a long hair skin girl at one point, which is a girl skinhead who doesn't have a fully shaved head, and then she got into stuff like early Elton John, Graham Parsons and Towns Van Zandt. Our Gel was into her reggae. You Roy, Bunny Whaler and Gregory Isaacs, who I got into a bit of trouble with, years later, when we played on the same bill and were misbehaving together backstage. Our Pat had a load of soul records that he used to buy on import from Robinson's records in Salford or Yank's records in town, as did our Matt, and all of them were into Northern Soul. They were all a few years older than me, so I was exposed to all these great, diverse music styles and scenes at an early age. My cousins were also the first ones of our family to go to university. Our Bernadette, Carmel and Joe all went, and our Matt and Pat went to Sale for Technical College to do art and ended up, years later, doing all the artwork for Happy Mondays and Black Grape. 
Top of the Pops was a big thing back in the late 60s and early 70s. I can remember seeing the small...